even though uh, okay, our department good. has some strange concept that these are ISL courses, but these are EE -E courses. And so to me, the, um, the circuit designers are really in the centroid of EE, -E, and so I make sure that the course really is good for circuit design as well as communication, signal processing, everything. And so, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about my um, overview of my research because it's been um, almost 10 years since I talked about my research to the whole group. So um, one of the things that we're very interested in these days is using optimization to design fibers and photonic components. So we have a project with people at Corning. You know, they're one of the leading manufacturers of fibers. and. We um, have some methods for designing fibers, and these are not like Yelena's methods for designing, you know, very small nanophotonic devices. These are um, different methods, and we're looking at things like how do we design a multimode fiber with the group delays um, as degenerate as possible, or things like that. And um, they're really interesting results that we're getting, but we haven't published anything yet. Um, then we also are working um, on a project with Facebook and actually what's interesting about this is that this is actually the first um, It has two facets, but this is the first contract ever between Facebook and Stanford So I'm proud to mention that point because Stanford came to I mean Facebook came to us and they said we need help with optical interconnect They did not say we need help with machine learning or with artificial intelligence. So I always tell that to my students. Don't just go where the herd is going. You know, do something really hard, and if it's really important and really hard, someone will seek your services out. And um, I think this is a very important message that we, we need to incorporate that in how we brand EE for our students. So part of this is, um, um, 25 years ago, we wrote a paper on an electro-optic comb generator to generate many optical frequencies, and um, we couldn't implement it then. But then I was introduced to Marco Lonkar, an old office mate of Yelena, and Marco um, realized the comb generator in thin film lithium niobate. So we just had a paper accepted for publication in Nature on that comb generator. And we hope that this will actually be used in future interconnects in data centers. So um, Facebook came to us a couple of years ago and invited us to, to work um, on, on optical interconnects for data centers. And what we focused, we decided to focus on was what we call co-packaged optics for switches. So basically inside the data centers they have these switches that are small IP routers, and they have um, uh, throughputs of 12 and a half terabits per second, then the next generation will be 25, and the generation after that will be 50. And everyone um, agrees that, and of course, they're all interconnected by optical fibers. You know, optical fibers probably carry um, more than 90% of all the data in the world. Um, I mean, you know, probably more than 10 times as much as wireless, if not 100 times. And most of the traffic is inside the data centers. So you have these switches, and the optical interfaces have to be packaged in the same module as the chip. So companies like Arista Networks, um, founded by Ed, Andy Bechtelsheim, you know, they have a roadmap for these um, switches. And then they're looking at the industry who's developing silicon photonics and integrated photonics to um, be able to make optical interconnects that work with these switches. And um, in my opinion, um, there's a disconnect there. Um, things that people are working on in silicon photonics won't cut it. So they need help from system designers because one of the things that we can do is we can look at all the design choices in our minds, you know, and, and really find the right solution. There's a huge space of possibilities. And so what we realized was that we actually need coherent optical detection in these interfaces. And that's to give us wavelength selectivity even when the silicon-based 
the multiplexer's band path shifts due to thermal effects, and also it gives us the receiver sensitivity we need to accommodate silicon photonics, which is really incredibly lossy. And so this just was something I thought of myself um, when I, after listening to Andy Bechtelstein talk um, a few months ago, and, uh, but a lot of people have thought of the same idea. And um, so recently I teamed up with people at UC Santa Barbara, including Clint Chow and Larry Cauldron. And I think what we all have in common is we all worked in industry before going into academia. So we really have a strong sense of what's important and works in practice. And those guys at UC Santa Barbara are the absolute wizards of photonic integration, um, particularly silicon-based, also 3.5-based. And um, so I, I have a very specific message for our department. I think that we're at a point where we need to build up this area in our department or we will miss a huge opportunity because we're right at the point where optical interconnection is no longer a technology push, it's an application pull. And the future digital systems will depend absolutely on integrated optical interfaces. And if we miss the opportunity, um, we'll be missing one of the great you know, generational shifts in our field. So let's, um, let's talk about that in the future. And then I have some other projects. Um, one of the fun projects that we did recently is in, in multi-mode optical fiber, we did 90 by 90 MIMO transmission using 90 modes, and we achieved 202 bits per second per hertz spectral efficiency using 90 modes. Most of the work was done at Bell Labs, but we're, we're co-authors on this paper because we contributed towards it. And David and I are working on optical MIMO. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today though is power-limited submarine systems. And I'll tell you how I got involved in this. Basically, um, Facebook and Google are just growing like mushrooms, you know, in the backyard. Most of them you don't see, and suddenly they pop up and they're everywhere. And um, I was talking with one of the directors there, um, Steve Grubb, who's an old um, laser guy, and he was telling me about his submarine cable. I didn't ask him who's building it for you, but you know, these submarine cables cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And he was telling me about it and showing me pictures of what's in it. And then I said, Steve, oh my God, you know, whoever's designing this for you is designing it wrong. And so I thought about this, and that's where this research came from, is that conversation. And so it turns out, though, that um, I'm not the only person who realized that they were doing it wrong. So, you know, the, the thing about optical communications that maybe you should understand is that it was started by physicists, and physicists ruled the field. And, but the thing is, about 10 years ago, they begrudgingly ceded some control to people in communications because they realized that all the future generations of growth would come more from communications than from physics, or it would be an equal partnership. But um, in the submarine systems, which are the best systems, and of course only the smartest people work on those systems, um, <laughs> the, the physicists have tunnel vision. And there's some important things about physics that they just didn't understand, but of course, I'm not them. Um, so that's why I'm talking about it. So we're talking about the importance of physics, amplifier physics, and maximizing the capacity of submarine links. And another way to say this is we're talking about a system which is purely photonics and it's energy limited, and we want to use it efficiently, but that entails using the devices inefficiently. So the point is that if you only look at devices and not systems, you won't understand what this is about. And so I'm going to tell you how we can send bits under the ocean for about the same energy costs that um, you guys in electronics can send bits across a backplane, a few picojoules per bit. So um, these are some of the submarine cables. You know, they go, a lot of them across the Pacific. Um, some of them go around um, continents. And it's cheaper to build a submarine 
cable serving coastal cities in South America or Africa than it is to, you know, dig trenches and put them across the land. And inside one of these cables, I mean, in the middle there are glass fibers. There's maybe eight pairs, eight in each direction. It's typical. And then we have copper that carries the electrical power. And we have other barriers, um, steel wires um, for strength and so on. And um, that's what they look like. And here's a picture taken in the belly of a ship where the cable is being laid. And the cable is actually pretty skinny here, but um, there are these big bulges where the optical amplifiers are. So in the cable, um, every 50 kilometers, there's a node which has optical amplifiers. And an optical amplifier is just a laser without mirrors. It amplifies light by stimulated emission. And um, all of them are wired in series. Um, and they uh, put a high voltage on each end of the cable and the amount of power you can deliver into the cable is limited by the electrical resistance and by the voltage you can apply. And um, it's just amazing that any of this works. It's beyond <laughs> comprehension. Um, you know. So um, it turns out from a business standpoint, this is a good business. In 2016, there were 100,000 kilometers of submarine cables laid, and the investment in the last three years was five times as much in the previous three years. And it's driven by those you know, companies. Um, you can read their names, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and others. This particular cable is shared by Facebook and Microsoft. Anyway, um, these cables are amazing and fascinating. And I want to talk about the effect of the power feed constraint. So, so we can put about 12,000 volts on each end of the cable, and it has a resistance of 1 ohm per kilometer. And let's just do a simple example where the cable is 10,000 kilometers long, and the amplifiers are every 50 kilometers. That's the spacing. And um, you want to match the resistance of the source to the resistance of the load to maximize the power transfer. And as a result of that, each one of those amplifiers gets 18 watts of power. Each one of those little um, copper um, pill-shaped objects. And 10% of the power is used in control and monitoring. So you end up having, in this example, about 16 watts available for the amplifiers. And if you have eight fibers going in each direction, that gives you one watt for each amplifier. So that one watt is mostly driving the laser that pumps the optical amplifier. It's typically a, a laser diode at 980 nanometers. And it works just like my green laser pointer. All the physics I'm talking about is in a green laser pointer, um, or most of it. And the amplifiers are not that efficient overall. You end up converting about 5% of the electrical power into light. So basically, at each amplifier, you can have about 50 milliwatts coming out. And so this is the first aha that I had when Steve um, Grubb was telling me about that. He was telling me that we're trying to put as much power as we can into each fiber. And then I realized right away that information theory says you shouldn't do that. If you have a total power P and that gives you a capacity C1, it would be better to split it into two. You've got capacity C2 in each one of those systems, but it's generally larger than 2C2 is greater than C1. It's just because um, the capacity scales linearly in the number of dimensions and logarithmically in the number of um, the number the signal to noise ratio. So uh, maybe the physicists can be excused for not having studied information theory, but if they read anything about, um, like there's this famous paper, um, information rates in bosonic communications. Caves and Drummond, and it says the same thing, and it cites back to 1973. So this was known in the physics community, just not to the Russians and Ukrainians who designed those systems. But anyway, so the thing is that about 
three years ago, the people in the submarine community did realize this mistake and they've been going down this road. But this is where we come in. Where we come in is given a power constraint, how should you use each dimension most effectively? And this is where when we did our work, we can do 70% better in terms of capacity than that. Now in communications, if all the smartest people have looked at a channel and then they got a capacity and then you have a scheme that does 70% higher capacity, that's a big, big deal. It's not so much that you're so smart, it's what it implies about them. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I'm sorry, you have to put up with me for a few more years. So anyway, um, um, this is what we did. We looked at the physics of this problem. Um, okay, so um, these fiber, um, these cables have, let's say, S fibers, and each fiber has, um, I think, M amplifiers. And um, the amplifier has a gain which is very, um, wavelength or frequency dependent because it's, a, uh, it's an atomic fluorescence that's been star shifted by random splittings in glass. So it's a really messy spectrum. And um, so it's not flat and we have to have gain flattening filters. And the gain flattening filters have to basically flatten the gain because if you let the gain even be non-flat by 1% here, and then you go through 200 amplifiers, you're gonna have a real big problem. So the gain flattening has to be done very precisely. And there are some adjustable, adaptive, liquid crystal-based filters in there that help with this. Okay, so the number of fibers we use is an important variable. And um, basically, um, in an ideal case, if there were no um, power that goes into controlling and supervising these amplifiers, the optimum would be to use an infinite number of fibers uh, because log, linear versus log. But because there's a certain overhead power associated with each fiber we add, because we have to control it, um, the, the optimum is some finite number of fibers. So now it gets messy. Um, so inside the core you have erbium and um, you pump with light at 980 nanometers, and it excites the erbium from some ground level to some upper metastable, well, this is an upper pumping level. Then it decays to an upper metastable level, which has maybe a 10 microsecond lifetime. And then when the light at 1550 comes in, it induces stimulated emission. And um, so we, Use the standard models for these amplifiers. I don't want to go into all the details, but these models were worked out 30 years ago by, one of these guys was my exercise partner and the other one was my drinking partner. <laughs> okay. So um, the, the equations uh, modeling the amplifiers are partial differential equations. Z is along the fiber and there are terms that can, that that correspond to stimulated emission, spontaneous emission, and absorption. And um, we have to solve these equations, these partial differential equations, to model the amplifiers properly. I'm not going to talk about how we do that. I'm going to focus on the bigger picture of the system. So um, this is showing the gain and absorption coefficients of the erbium ions for particular um, condition of population inversion as a function of wavelength. And um, this is the, the main peak. And this region here is called the C-band, conventional band. This is where the amplifiers are mostly used because they have a high and relatively flat gain in that region. And- um, How do you see relatively flat? It doesn't look relatively flat. Well, it's not that flat. I think it's you have to put gain flattening filters in there. Um, and it, it really, the amount of flatness depends on, um, on how, you, um, how you pump it. It's, it's complicated. But anyway, our physical modeling is very accurate. We've done experiments. We're working with Corning um, to do experiments to demonstrate all these concepts. So these are some measurements 
of the gain versus wavelength and the noise versus wavelength um, comparing our model to the experiments. And this is a very accurate model. Um, there's no doubt that it's a, it's a good model. Okay, now another thing about physics we have to model is the current on linearity in the fiber. And this in itself is a whole complicated story. Um, it's really made unnecessarily complicated because basically when light goes through a medium, um, it slows down because it interacts with electrons. And if the potential, the equivalent of one electron potential is not harmonic, um, then there will be a small in intensity dependence. So when the intensity gets higher, the refractive index gets a little higher. So the light moves slower when there's more intensity. So that simple fact leads to third order intermodulation distortion between different um, wavelengths in the fiber. And there's a Gaussian noise model. Because these fibers have so much dispersion, there's a model that shows that you can accurately model that as Gaussian noise. And um, we publish a discrete form of that model. But anyway, what this, this is an expression that gives you the nonlinear noise in the nth wavelength channel as a function of the powers in three other channels. And then there are these coefficients um, which are complicated, but you can calculate them and store them once. So you have this model. Now, if you're just doing an optimization of capacity or, well, um, some of the optimization problems we've studied using this model are actually convex in their formulation. This problem that we're studying today is not convex. Um, but anyway, um, these pictures just help you visualize the coefficients that go into these equations. And these indices um, basically correspond to frequency differences. So the bright spot in the middle is cell phase modulation. And these lines here are cross phase modulation. And these points in here are four wave mixing. But it's really all just generalized four wave mixing. We don't distinguish the two. And so this is the optimization problem that we're trying to solve. It looks a lot like. Um, like what you do in multi-carrier modulation. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. So you have these n wavelength channels, um, lambda 1 through lambda n, and you're trying to allocate power into them to maximize the capacity. And then the capacity basically has a simple formula. It's a log of 1 plus SNR multiplied by the number of dimensions. So the number of dimensions, there's two because we're using two orthogonal polarizations. Then in each channel, we have the bandwidth of the channel that's delta F. And then we have log of 1 plus SNR. And the SNR has the signal power in the nth channel. And then we have the noise power due to just the optical amplifier amplified spontaneous emission plus the nonlinear noise, and the nonlinear noise is a function of the powers in all the other channels. But really, most of the complexity of this problem is in the amplifier physics, and that doesn't really appear here, because um, um, it's, it's in those partial differential equations. It's implicit here, but it's not explicit here. And then we have an indicator function here, which is one if, and this is actually very important. You see, the, the main, part of the physics that we understood that other people didn't understand is that the amplifier has a gain curve, which is a function of wavelength. And um, you can only send information through the fiber if the gain is above the loss. And if you put in more power, you saturate the gain, you bring it down, and you decrease the number of channels where the gain exceeds the loss. And that's what they missed. But that's really um, fundamental to this problem. And this is an indicator function. We only can have information in the channel if the gain exceeds the loss. You replace it by a differentiable sigmoid function, for those of you who are in optimization. So, so we, we apologize to- Joe, mm -hmm. quick question about the previous slide. So the log one plus, S plus SNR, that that's just your assuming additive white gas. Yeah, yeah. Noise. Uh, but this SNR is associated with some nonlinearity. 
Right. So there are these issues that we have to talk about. Like, um, there are many issues that might seem confusing unless I describe them. For example, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry um, to speak out loud, but yeah. The thing is that it, it's complicated, but basically, um, um, there's a, a, the noise is really well modeled as Gaussian, and this is amplifier noise, which is really, truly Gaussian, and then this is the noise due to the third order intermodulation distortion or nonlinearity, which is actually well modeled as Gaussian, but its variance is dependent on the powers of all the other channels. So it's deterministic. <clears throat> um, well, conditioned on knowing all the data symbols that were transmitted, it's deterministic. But yeah. basically, here we do single user decoding. You know, each channel only decodes itself, so all the other channels okay. are noise. And you can't even do um, too much with your own data because um, the speeds are too high. Right. So I, I think what people are saying is that probably the, the amplifier noise is unbounded energy. The nonlinear things are probably bounded energy. But it's also the case that you're probably not looking at the long tail with the distribution, so the Gaussian approximation is distribution. That's yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah, because we're using very strong error correction codes, LDPC codes, which have thresholds of ten to the minus two. Yeah. So we only care. Um, you only care yeah. about that. that, that right. Yeah. Right. <clears> yeah. <throat> okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So when we use particle form optimization. Um, we don't like it, but it works, and we know how to use it. Uh, it's one of the best um, general optimization techniques when the problem is in convex. But anyway, um, what I'm showing you here is a space. These are optimization variables. And we initialize the optimization. And the optimization variables are the lengths of the amplifiers and also the powers in each one of the 130 potential channels. So we have. Um, I think about 131 optimization variables. And so basically, you're trying to get to the maximum value of your total capacity. Um, and so you initialize it with many different initial conditions. And um, because this uh, landscape has local maxima, um, you know, um, that's what we're trying to overcome. So basically, what happens in particle swarm is that each one of the um, initializations does the best that it can and finds its local optimum. But then they talk to each other and they swarm, um, the, you know, wherever they're finding the best, the sweetest nectar. Basically, they swarm there like bees. And the thing is that um, after we found what appears to be an optimum, we use saddle-free Newton's method to find the true optimum. Um, so anecdotally, we believe this is probably the global optimum, um, but we don't really know. Um, so in our studies, we these are some parameters that we assumed, um, and um, um, we you know these systems use coherent detection and they use very strong error correction codes. The codes are within one dB of capacity, so everything that's known to man is used here to do the best that we can. And so we're, we're looking at a link that's 14,000 kilometers long. So this is a link that goes from, let's say, the west coast to Asia, and then doesn't just stop at Japan, but it goes to some other places. It's really long. And um, so this is some of the results of the optimization. And um, <clears throat> this is including the current on linearity, and this is neglecting it. So the difference only appears when the power is very high. Um, and in most of the system designs, the current on linearity actually isn't that important. But um, so the way the optimization works is that you, you basically um, have an outer loop and you pick a certain number of fibers. And then you, you allocate your power to the optical amplifiers in those fibers, the pump power. Um, this is that variable there. And then you calculate the optimal power allocation and the capacity that you get per fiber. And then you multiply that by the number of fibers. 
And then, um, so if you start with one fiber, then you go to two fibers and three fibers, and eventually you'll find the optimum, including the optimum number of fibers. And um, so this is um, just for one fiber varying the pump power between small and large. And one of the things, this is showing the power allocation. When the pump power is small, um, at these wavelengths here, the gain does not exceed the loss. <coughs> So you don't allocate power there. And when the power goes higher, then you have a larger bandwidth um, available. So this is um, the results of the optimization in terms of power allocations. So and, Joe, um, not Joe, Corey. Hmm. So once you did this optimization for the power allocation, now for each one of the frequencies, you need to design a separate kind of LDPC code? No, no, all the channels are the same code. And this, um, the thing is that we, um, so if you look at the spectral efficiency, um, some of the channels give you six and some give you seven, okay? So if I were actually implementing that system, I would just ignore this little gain and I would code them all to give me six bits per second per hertz. Um, but the thing is that um, in this business, um, um, people use LDPC codes with, or similar codes with um, variable rates. You know, we can mm -hmm. achieve any rate, which is an in a, um, a rational multiple um, of some base rate um, with a one dB gap capacity. So um, yeah, we can do the power allocation and, and code to achieve any spectral efficiency. So, so today, in, in the in the codes that are in the cables that are being laid, are they basically doing this number of bits per hertz, and are they doing the preferred detection? Yes, they're all they're doing all of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're doing everything. Yeah. So, so how many in the cables that are basically going up now? How many bits per hertz are they basically? Doing? Um, it's probably it's probably around. I mean, I don't know exactly, but it's probably <clears throat> four or six in that range. Um, so the other thing you said is as the power goes up, I thought you said that you don't get as many channels that goes down because you saturate those. But here you have the opposite happening. Here as you increase the power. Then oh, this is the pump power. The pump power is a variable here. So this is with very low pump power. And then this is with very high pump power. There's a six fold difference in the pump power between right. here and here. So the higher pump power supports higher power per channel and gives you a wider bandwidth. But the thing is that your total pump power over the entire cable is limited. So if you use a higher pump power in one fiber, this, this is six times higher pump power than this. So maybe I should use six fibers with this pump power instead of using one fiber with this pump power. So I'm, I'm hiding that. Um, I'm hiding a lot of things here. Yeah. So anyway, um, in the end, um, um, these people um, in TE Subcom um, in New Jersey, um, they published um, a system that got amazing results. Um, they got a, this was um, 14,000 kilometers long, and they did an experiment, and they were able to get about 10 terabits per second in each one of those fibers. Um, and when we theoretically model their system, this is the capacity we get. When we model it the way they operated it, with high per power, high, high power per channel and using the bandwidth they used, but when we use our optimization and our power allocation, we increase the capacity by 1.7. It's surprising it's only 1.7, isn't it? Given yeah. what you just said earlier. And you have many more fibers? No. Yeah. Well, we're using more fibers, yeah. Okay, no, that's... Um, you know, the linear versus log, should, shouldn't it play out to be... Well, no, they're problem? already using the linear versus log, but what they're not ah. doing is optimizing for the amplifier. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, let's say that using... Um, um, understanding that you should use more spatial dimensions approximately double the capacity, and then we're increasing it 70% more on mm -hmm. top of that. Um, we're picking up the breadcrumbs, so to speak. <laughs> Um, and basically, this has to do with uh, um, identifying a, a better regime for operating the optical amplifiers where you have 
less saturation. So um, this is also interesting. Um, this is um, <coughs> in the optimized system, the design that we're actually recommending, which uses, I think it uses 30 fiber pairs. Um, this is the input power distribution, and actually we're, we're not using all the wavelengths. We'd, we'd rather operate at lower pump power and have more fibers. And um, what's interesting is that this is the noise. So the noise in the first amplifier looks like this, and after 287 amplifiers, the noise has built up. And then um, that causes the gain um, to go down. So um, in the last amplifier where you have more noise, the gain is saturated and the gain has dropped. So um, it's kind of fun to look at um, all of these curves. And so um, this is um, showing the optimal number of spatial dimensions for that system. And this PO is called an overhead power. It's basically how much power you need in every, if you light up a fiber, how much power do you need to control it and supervise it? And if that is zero, the optimal number of spatial dimensions is very high. Um, it can be infinite except for the kernel linearity. But then when you impose a realistic value of that, like um, 0.1 watt, then um, this is the optimum that we came up with. So the optimum for this system is 20 fiber pairs per direction. And we put 44 milliwatts of pump power in each one, and we get a total capacity of 383 terabits per second to the gate. <coughs> Joe, what's the cost per fiber per amplifier? Um, so yeah, of course, that's a really big issue. Um, I mean, the whole cable costs hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know the exact cost, but um, the, the price, um, it's not quite linear in the number of fibers, but it's almost linear in the number of fibers and amplifiers. So um, it is expensive to use more. Um, but what you're doing when you use more is you're amortizing not only the cable, but the, the act of laying the cable and all of that. Um, so this is really interesting. If you take the total electrical power divided by the capacity, it comes out to be 6.6 .6 picojoules per bit. So that's really amazing. I don't know what to say. Um, we're going 14,000 kilometers versus 14 millimeters, same power. OK, and then um, now we talk about economics um, to your question. So. What if we say it's too expensive to use 20 fibers, let's only use 10. Well, if you optimize it the way we're suggesting, um, you still get 80% of the capacity. Um, so this is useful in general, including economic constraints. Um, so the last thing I wanna say is just this, that we're currently working with Corning on doing experiments to demonstrate all of this. And after we've done what we can do with our limited resources, then we'll, we'll talk to companies like PE Subcom and try to um, you know, get them to do experiments um, with us. Um, yes? Yeah, does that 6.6 .6 picojoules include the stuff that's on the ground at oh, the ends? No, it doesn't. So actually, David, I, I thank, thank you very much for pointing that out. That's a very important point. Yeah, the 6.6 .6 picojoules per bit is only for the cable. So at the terminal equipment, we have um, we have these um, um, very high. Uh, we have 75 to 100 gigasample per second data converters. You know, a bunch of those. We have the LDPC decoders, which are the biggest um, chips known to man. So um, um, it probably costs um, hundreds of picojoules per bit um, in terms of the terminal equipment. Yeah. Um, Jim? So if you look at your thing uh, from the power standpoint, you'd obviously pump at 1480 versus... Uh, You're nine. right, yeah. So why is it that they're not doing that? I have an opinion about that, but I'm curious what you think. Um, well, um, the power I mean, is obviously um, lower, and I don't think heating is an issue. Uh, you don't think that cooling... Right. I mean, it's all under C. I think it 
cooling is probably not an issue. But well, um, what we were told is that the 980 diodes are more reliable. Um, that's what we were told. You know, we asked that same question because if you pump, I mean, you can pump at 1480 nanometers or 980 nanometers, and when you pump at 1480, you're putting in a photon which has like 90% of the energy of the photon, I mean, 1.1 times the energy of what you're getting out versus um, one and a half times. So it's much more efficient in terms of just quantum um, um, defect. That ratio, but um, but I think that the the community uses 980 nanometer diodes because they're more um, more efficient, more reliable. They're, they're definitely more efficient, and you can pump them harder. Yeah, yeah, um, but I I don't really know the the answer to okay. your question. Yeah. Um, we hope we can find out about that more in the future. A lot of these um, things that we're working on are um, there are many trade secrets involved. It's impossible to find out. Yeah, I mean, it could well be reliability, and they don't really want to talk about that very much. Yeah. <laughs> but certainly from a power standpoint, yeah. uh, you would choose 9, uh, I mean, 1480. Joe, you said gain has to be greater than loss. If we, if we take the problem of just the length of this table, we specify the length, is it, and, and say you just want to go that far, my intuition would be that you'd want gain a little bit less than loss. Not, not, but gain is the source of the noise and the problem. Well, you're right, but the thing is that we're going through 287 amplified spans. So um, if the gain doesn't equal the loss in each span, um, if it's one dB off in each span, you'll have an overall loss of 287 dB. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. still, in a given problem like this table length, you still want to gain less than loss, I believe. Yeah. If it's a short length without, um, I mean, you can do that basically in the last span. Yeah. So, um, so, I have a question. so um, when John Chalky came up with the DSL, there were all sorts of computations that show that what he's achieving is essentially close to the fundamental limits. But then subsequently there were different and better models that led to you know, higher rates that were achievable over the same channels. To what extent do you think that now you are really, really close to the best that can be done here? Um. Well, um, yes. For example, um, if you look at something like nonlinearity, nonlinearity is um, is a crosstalk between different channels. So um, I don't know the, the proper terminology, but you can. Uh, we're using doing single user encoding and single user decoding, and you know we can also do multi user encoding and multi user decoding, and we can treat that nonlinear interference as a signal. Uh, something that has information rather than just noise. Um, but the problem is that that's impossible to implement because each one of these modems um, is operating at several hundred gigabits per second. And um, in order to do that multi-user encoding, you would have to exchange information between them. But you can't take all that information into a backplane and exchange it. It has to stay on a chip. Um, so you know, so that's um, that's why um, the the suite of things that we consider is somewhat different from what um, what might be considered an information theory. So what about your models for the noise? Or could they be improved? You're assuming these additive Gaussian. Yeah, so the amplifier noise is really additive Gaussian noise. That comes from quantum mechanics, you know. But um, the nonlinear noise is approximately Gaussian. That comes from the central limit theorem and the fact that we have lots and lots of dispersion. And I don't see that changing. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.